plan for this evening is I'm going to run through roughly a 15 minute presentation and then and then give uh, lots of time for questions afterwards. So, and I apologize, I'm obviously on a different monitor. So if it looks like I'm not looking exactly at the camera, I apologize for that. I'm just looking at the monitor off to the side. Uh, what I want to do uh, this evening is just walk you through the touchstone story. Um, we had a remarkable year last year in 2020. And I think 2021 is setting up the, the exact same way and just want to give everybody a a really good overview of, of where we're at and where we're going from here. Just want to start with similar to what uh, Roland talked about. I mean, there's there's a bunch of advisories in our, our presentation. You can get that off of our website as well. I think the big takeaway on these advisories, obviously our business is subject to a lot of commodity uh, commodity price fluctuations, which we have absolutely no control over, especially on the oil side and uh, on reservoirs and a lot of geology that can change over time. But we'll definitely give you our best uh, best outlook that we can in this presentation today. Um, so the, the four pillars that we've put together at, at Touchstone that have, have changed a little bit, but still remain basically the same, which is our exploration upside, which at this time last year, uh, you know, we had a very, very big exploration program. Happy to say that, um, you know, basically the first four wells that we've, that we've drilled have all encountered hydrocarbons of various various um, amounts and as a result of that you know it's almost gone into a development exploration program so that's certainly changed talk about the scalable economic growth and I think the real key takeaway from that slide tonight is that 20-year drilling program um, that we have now in place that's both development and exploration it really is remarkable how the company's changed um, I think from being a fairly high risk um, program that we had last year to one that now has a combination of some very high risk opportunities I'll continue to call them world-class prospects, as well as some really, really fundamental development things that we can do now as well. Uh, operating responsibly, this is really, you know, the catch-all of our ESG. Um, and I'm not going to talk a lot about that today because we've got some really good presentations on the website as well in, in what we're doing. But but we love we're working in Trinidad. It's our it's our only asset. Um, it's just a great place to do business, and and our plan is to leave it in a much better place than than when we started. Uh, the value creation talk about that uh, obviously the biggest thing that's changed there is our, our market cap was the success we've had you know we've gone from about 66 million uh last year um to we're just over 560 million i think we're around that range today as well and then if you take a look at um the reserves that i'll show you later as well that you know the value creation has gone up dramatically with the, the drilling success we've had so it's it's been exciting you know i i kind of joke it's um it's been an overnight success that's been 10 years in the making. So we put together a really good foundation using these four pillars, and now we're starting to see uh, the success as a result of that really solid foundation. So what does that foundation look like? It's uh, all of our assets that are in the southern part of Trinidad, uh, located on the southern part of the island. And they're really broken into two categories. We call them our development acreage, which is these orange blocks that you see on the west side of the island. And basically, they're into mature oil fields that go back to the 1950s, huge oil in place. And we've been applying technology, drilling wells, doing workovers that's uh, increased our production and given us a really, really stable base. And at today's prices is more than paying all the bills for us um, in what we've done. Current production is around 1,300 barrels a day. But we haven't drilled a well in almost two years there now. Um, we've just been doing workovers and focusing on the other part of our, our portfolio, which is this big block that we call our oratoire block, which is the exploration acreage. And I think uh, over the next couple of months, we're probably gonna have to change that as it's no longer pure exploration. It's now a combination of exploration and development. That's the main part of the presentation that I'll talk about today, but I really don't want people to forget about what we've got going on on the west side of the island either. Just to put Trinidad in context and specifically our Oratois block, I think it's really important to just talk about where we are geologically, regionally. And there's really two confluences going on here. We've got the Eastern Venezuelan basin, and, and I would argue it's the richest hydrocarbon basin in the world. Uh, and we're basically on the updip end of that. That yellow star is Trinidad, and specifically our Oratois Valley that we see in there. And then you see this other big um, yellow circle that's basically where exxon apache even too low all those other companies have been drilling in guyana and, and moving down into Suriname. it's that same basic geological um area and we'll talk about that one of the big prospects that we have is very similar to what exxon's drilling offshore is something that we're going to look at drilling onshore in trinidad in probably late 20 uh 2022 um is likely when we'll get around to that 
basically what it is is it's uh turned out sits right at the confluence of all of these things uh hydrocarbon rich basin uh tons tons of sediment fairly young uh quite complicated but it's just uh it's a great area to be to be drilling wells in so the oratois block that we have um our phase one of our exploration program was to drill four uh prospects uh coho cascadura chinook and royston um, we changed it up a little bit in how we did it. We actually drilled Coho, uh, Cascadura, then we went to Chinook, and then we went back and drilled another well at Cascadura, and we'll be drilling the Royston well um, probably in early Q2, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But the real key to this project for us is this big gas pool that you see here that's called Central Block. It's a pool that's currently operated by Shell. It was uh, discovered around uh, year 2000 um, by a small independent. And we had the opportunity to go in and actually see some of the data in there a number of years ago. And what we concluded was there's gotta be more of these types of pools. And to, to describe what this type of pool is, it's huge. Um, this particular pool, this central block pool, pool is gonna produce about a half a TCF of gas and about 25 million barrels of liquids. Um, so really almost a, a, an offshore type prospect when you look at how, how large it is. The really nice thing about it is that it gives us a good uh, analogous pool to base our exploration, our development, and our production profile on. That pool came on production about 85 million cubic feet a day 20 years ago, 19 years ago, and it's currently doing north of 40 million a day. So it gives you a really good idea that these are big reserves in place and uh, long life. And the best part about it is that's going to all get drained by four wells, so not much capital up front. So knowing what we knew about Central Block, we went and drilled Coho, which was our smallest prospect. And uh, I'll talk about that. Then we went to Cascadura, Chinook, and Royston. There are two takeaways of this map before I get into some specifics. Is this red line going through the middle of our property is the main gas line that goes to the petrochemical facilities in Trinidad. It's uh, got up to about 500 million cubic feet a day of capacity. Um, and we'll be tying in directly into that line. As a matter of fact, the owners of that line, which is the National Gas Company, will actually build that line directly to our various spots that we require to tie into. And then there's the green line that goes through the middle of the property as well, the other direction, that's an oil line. And that's really significant because this is liquids rich gas. And uh, you'll see that we'll have initially a couple thousand barrels a day of liquids uh, when we bring these on, but it'll be up to probably be up to 5,000 fairly quickly um, as we continue to, to move through here. So it's a very unique situation on an exploration. We're close to market, close to pipelines, um, you know, there's big demand by all the petrochemicals and we can talk about that. Um, so it's, it's a great place to be. So the phase one of the exploration, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly, but we drilled the coho well, we had ended up about hundred feet, 105 feet in that pay. We then drilled Cascadura and we were hoping to get a lot deeper at Cascadura. And because of the amount of gas in the well bore, we were unable to, but we ended up with over a thousand feet of pay. Um, Chinook uh, to the south, we ended up about six, just over 600 feet of pay. And then Cascadura deep, um, we tried again to go deeper again at Cascadura. We got a couple thousand feet deeper, but still haven't got all the way down to where we wanted to. And then at Royston, you can see that's a pretty current picture in there of the road that we've now built, uh, building into, into uh, that area. So I'll go through these really quickly. And I'll, as, uh, as Roland mentioned, these are all available on our, our website. Cascadura, uh, which is the first one that we drilled, you know, this is just remarkable. We were hoping for something that would be four or 500 barrels a day. Um, although we knew on our 3D we could move up structure and there was all this gas in the area. Uh, we ended up encountering just a massive gas column. We did two separate tests um, and you can see the AOF rates here. They're really offshore type AOF rates. Um, we will only be producing from one zone at a time in here. Um, so the upper test results will be the one that we'll actually be producing from. And we think this well will come on at somewhere around 35 to 40 million cubic feet a day and add roughly 6,000 BOEs a day to production when it comes on um, later this year, prior to the end of the year. Um, we then went to the south, drilled a completely separate structure down at Chinook and uh, ended up with uh, about 589 feet of pay in the, the targeted zone that we wanted to. Um, and this is something that I'll, I'm sure I'll get some questions on, but basically we were hoping we would test this in January and February uh, for additional gas prospects. Uh, the gas equipment that we need to test this um, wasn't available till last week. So what we did do is the, the technical team went ahead and, and perforated a couple of zones that 
Um, we're, we're a little bit of a science project, but really wanted to see what some of these zones um, looked like that, that we didn't really know whether they were going to be water or, or oil. And uh, interestingly enough, out of the two zones we've tested, we got free hydrocarbon, free oil in both of them, one 41 API and the other one roughly 34, 35 API oil. The 41 API was right from the bottom of the well bore. And um, it's interesting, but it's obviously not commercial. The second one, we were putting on an extended production test, probably starting, uh, let's say, the end of next week, and uh, we'll get a better idea of rates. But the real significance of this is that we're seeing hydrocarbons in these deeper zones, and um, that really sets up, you know, multiple, multiple prospects on this on this block that we we didn't even think about uh, a couple of months ago when we started to do these testing. So I think, you know, uh, some of the investors may be a little discouraged that. We all of a sudden have these oil tests, but quite frankly, these oil tests were just to kind of buy a little bit of time and understand the rock a little bit better while we were waiting for the gas test to come out. But, but you know, certainly oil at the price we're at now, these are very, very significant indicators for us uh, on a go-forward basis. We are still going to test the gas zones at Chinook, and that will commence over the next uh, over the next month. So nothing's really changed. Um, but probably what we have now is more information that, that I think personally is very, very encouraging. We then went back to Cascadura Deep. Um, and as I say, we didn't get as deep as we wanted to get, but it is by far the best well that we've ever drilled. Um, it, uh, it's got multiple gas zones. Uh, the rig's actually on that well today, and that testing program will start uh, that later this week or over the weekend. And there's multiple zones to test in that. But it it really um, it really does look fantastic, and we can correlate that with uh, Cascadura. So that that field is really coming together quickly. Then the Royston prospect, which we are building the road into right now, this gives you a really good idea of how we put these prospects together. Basically, we take old well information in this case from 1960s, a well that Shell drilled, apply some new technology to it, upgrade the prospect with the seismic that we have. Um, we think there's 700 feet of bypass gas pay in this particular well. So what we're going to do is go, we found the old surface location and we'll go drill a new well on the old surface location. Uh, mitigates our, our environmental impact that we have and a bunch of other uh, permits that, you know, allow us to move more quickly. So that well is going to get drilled in May. That is by far the largest prospect that we've ever drilled in the company or on the Ora 12 block. So we are very excited about that. And if it's successful, there's probably three or four other um, development wells on that. Um, and then... This is a map that is, is fairly new. It's, it's basically taking all the information from phase one of the exploration program and now laying out on the block all the different prospects that we see. Um, you can see the different anomalies. I talked about a deep prospect that was similar to what Exxon was drilling over in Guyana. That sits below the Royston well. It's that gray area that you see there. It's a Cretaceous prospect. Um, it, it really is probably the most exciting thing we have sort of down the road um, and we're bringing a new rig into the country that will be able to drill down to that depth and uh, we're really excited about that but that that's sort of another layer of exploration after we continue to move on so it um, you know it's great so this block in summary when you look at it we've now got a gas contract in place with the national gas company they'll buy all the gas that we can give them um, it'll go to the petrochemical business so exceptionally high load factor We've got a 10 to 20 year drilling inventory now, a combination of development and exploration. Uh, we've now identified development locations at both Chinook and uh, Cascadura. And uh, the team's identified these 21 exploration targets on the block as we go forward. So, you know, it's it's as good as it gets. It's basically an entire company for the next 10 years sitting out on that R12 block. Um, and, you know, we look back two years and I, I honestly can say we couldn't have imagined uh, things to have turned out like they have. Having said all of that, there are going to be some bumps in the road here. Um, you know, there's going to be some time delays. We already saw that in the first couple of months this year. We didn't get the testing done as quickly as we wanted to. Um, you know, it's just going to take time. And and I really, you know, I really hope that the shareholders are there with us. This is a very large long-term project. And um, we want to do it right. We want to manage the reservoirs properly. And we really want to understand it. So that's what we've been doing. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the uh, oil prospects on the west side of the island, although as oil heads to $70, these things become exceptionally, um, you know, exceptionally valuable to us. We've got over 200 drilling locations there. The new rig we're bringing into the country will be great for doing that kind of work. Uh, COVID response and our, our 
ESG stuff. Um, I, I won't talk about it except that we are very active and quite frankly, we've been doing that for two or three years. So um, you'll see our first ESG report coming out this year. And I think it'll be pretty impressive of what we've done. And, and we think there's a lot more we can do in Trinidad as well. Uh, the value creation, I uh, just touch on that really quickly. I think this gives you the reserves are probably the best way to summarize what we've done. Uh, we just put out the reserve report last week. We've now on a 3P basis got 100, just over 100 million barrels, uh, BOEs, barrels of oil equivalent um, in our reserves. And, you, you know, you even look at uh, 2019 versus 2000 or 2020, we our 1P reserves this year are more than our 3P reserves were in 2019. So it kind of outlines the kind of success that, that we see. But um, And this does not include Chinook. It doesn't include any of the deeper part of Cascadura, and it doesn't include anything for Royston. So lots of room to expand on that. This is our, um, uh, our basically the financial summary. We're in pretty good position. Uh, we raised about 28 million in uh, in November of cash, and we had about seven million on the balance sheet going into that raise. So we're we're certainly well funded through to getting Cascadura and big gas production on as we get through the end of this year. And um, that's the that's sort of the investment summary. And and maybe what I'll do is I'll leave it there, turn it back to Roland, and he can ask me any questions that are coming up in the box. First up, uh, would you consider using CO2 injection uh, on your oil wells? So there are a couple of CO2 projects on the on the Western block. Um, and quite frankly, we, we've looked at it a little bit. We think that, uh, I think it's gonna be a good project. I know I, the one company I'm sure that they're referring to is Predator that's had some good success in there. Um, we still think there's another phase before that, before CO2. We still think there's a lot of oil that could be drilled with existing wells, doing recompletions and then doing a water flood. So that's really been our focus is gonna be doing some pressure maintenance before we, uh, before we go to CO2. But, you know, in fairness, we're hoping it works for them and then we can implement it, right? We'll let them be the leaders. Um, the next question. Given the delays over testing, the limitations of the gas testing equipment and the increase in drilling, what contingency will you be taking to ensure there are no future delays in testing? Do you plan not to lease equipment on a similar basis to the rig contract? Yeah, let, let me let me be real frank on this. I, there's no way I can say there won't be delays going forward. There are going to be delays going forward. It's just it's the business we're in. Um, we're on an island. Um, you know, we still got COVID. We got weather. We got all those things. There are going to be delays. Like I just want to be right up front with that. So we give our best estimates of that. We are entering into some longer term contracts um, that have some rights for us, like the drilling contract, for instance, where you know we've got first right on the rig kind of thing. Um, now that the gas equipment's back on the island, we think we can keep it busy by by keeping the drilling. In fairness to them, you know, we were using them for 90 days and then not needing them for three months. So they were looking for other business. So what we will be able to do is get a more continual program, which is good for the service providers as well as us. But um, we're going to have delays, guarantee you. When do you expect the institutional shareholder base to increase in size and what effort is being made to achieve this? Yeah, it's... it's um, so the institutional base did increase significantly when we did that raise in November. Um, and then the other thing that's happening now is because our market cap's getting larger, um, you know, the institutions are starting to be of interest. But as, as most people know, a lot of the institutions don't like buying in the market. And unfortunately, we don't need cash. Um, right now, we're, you know, fully funded through to this project. And then this project just kicks off so much cash when it comes on stream that, you um, you know, that, that's going to be the challenge for some of these institutions that like to get in on the, what I'll call the discount equity deals. Um, we just don't, you know, we don't see that happening right now. So that's one, I think that's one of the challenges for the institutions. Had a number of people ask, it's a very similar question. Um, how will test results be announced? RNS is per zone or as a whole? Are you going to announce as you go? Yeah, I think the plan right now is we'll announce as we go. And the reason for that is exactly the question. There's a lot of people that have a lot of, um, especially on social media, there seems to be a lot of eyes on the ground down there. So what we want to make sure is that everybody's got the same information at the same time. And it's quite frankly, it's hard to hide a 20 or 30 million a day flare. Uh, <laughs> and right? um, what's the relationship of the deeper oil tested formations to the offshore oil prone formations regionally, the same age and type? So the, 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 two, well, the two zones we tested at Chinook um, are actually in what we call the Herrera. So they're not equivalent to, let's say, what Exxon and those guys are doing in, in offshore. That's actually in the Cretaceous. 
so uh, quite a bit deeper. And the only place that we're going to test the Cretaceous at this point is over at Royston. And uh, that prospect is going to be named Kraken, which is that mythical sea creature. We thought that was a good name for, for chasing something like the Cretaceous. So. Um, okay, we have a few here. I think we kind of covered some of these here. Um, if Coho, Cask, and Chinook fields are confirmed to hold circa one TCF of reserves, can you please confirm what production output you're expecting to achieve with infill drilling by the end of 2022? No pressure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a that's a big one, and I I, I obviously um you know I obviously can't I, I really don't want to comment on Chinook until we get another test off on it into the gas zone because uh, it's a separate anomaly, it's a different test entirely. I think the best thing to do is look at the independent engineering report. Uh, you know, what we see at Coho and what we see at uh, Cascadero One, you know, they're using roughly 30, 35 million a day as the 1P initial production. Um, so if you take a look at that, you know, it, 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 it looks like you could have a million a day on by the end of this year, uh, certainly. And then with success at, um, at Cascadero and Chinook, you layer on top of that during 2022. So I, I don't mean to be that vague, but I think, you know, it's just we got to be really careful and I don't want to set expectations too high on what we're doing. Here. In the question about uh, institutions, you mentioned the word dividends. Um, when would you hope to start being able to pay some sort of dividend? Yeah, you know, we had that discussion at our strategic board meeting in December. So it's it's a very much a live discussion. And um, because we have virtually no debt, uh, you know, it's not like the first thing you need to do is pay your debt off when this, this cash starts to come in. So I think it becomes a very real discussion towards the end of this year. Um, and, you know, if you were to ask me, I, I could see something being implemented um, fairly early in 2022. But my philosophy, and I think the board's on the same page, we'd like to start with something quite small so that we could continue to grow that as that went along. I, I never want to have to go backwards on dividends. And the next one I'll try and uh, read quite carefully. Considering that turbitides sometimes can be very complicated or complex to develop regarding depletion and infill wells, how good are the current seismic data for Cascadura and Chinook wells? And would you consider doing any VSP or more wireline logging? Um, so the data actually we have over Chinook and Cascadura and even Coho is excellent. It's 3D data. Um, and we've, you know, we've been able to uh, identify very, very accurately um, what we're seeing. So I don't think we're going to require much. I think one of the things we'd like to do, and it was part of the reason for testing these other zones at Chinook, was we want to try to correlate those, what we're seeing on seismic with which thrust sheet we can see or we can't see. And and um, so that's what this has been really helpful with as well for us. But I, I don't think we're going to be doing a lot more um, doing a lot more. Right now we're in the field shooting 21 kilometers of seismic over Royston. Um, and quite frankly, that's more to define the development play and to make sure when we drill that crack in Cretaceous play, we put it in exactly the right spot. Um, much progress has been made to date and many facets of your overarching plans have been uh, substantially de-risked including, of course, the NGC contract agreement uh, arrangement. Notwithstanding this progress, what do you see as the primary challenges and facing the company in the next 12 to 24 months? Uh, the, the, the challenges are going to be um, ramping up from zero to you know 100 miles an hour, which is what we're going to be doing, right? So the challenges are going to be getting some of the government approvals um, that we require. Uh, you know, I think that's already, we've shown that at Coho. It's taken us probably three or four months longer than we wanted to to get those approvals. Um, and then as we move to the phase two of the exploration side, we are going to be drilling into large anomalies that don't have an old well into them. So they're going to be more of your traditional exploration. Uh, so I think that that's probably going to be uh, another phase for us as we go. Um, but none of it's unmanageable. I think the, the biggest thing is that, uh, you know, that one TCF question is, I obviously didn't answer that, but I think that's one of the real things that we need to do is manage expectations. We're very, very early on in this program. And uh, we really just want to get good test data, get some of these wells on, uh, see what these turbidites will, will look like. Although, you know, the nice part is we've got this field right next door to us that's been producing for 20 years. So we do know what these things look like. We do know what they produce like. Um, but that's probably the biggest long-winded challenge is, is just going to be managing expectations for us.
because there, as I say, there's, you know, we're going to drill some dry holes on some of these exploration plays, um, and things are going to take longer. Okay, time for last couple now, Paul. Um, do you plan drilling with all three drilling rigs simultaneously next year, one on legacy, one at exploration, and one at development? Um, I don't think so. I'm, I'm sure if Scott pokes his head in here, he's going to tell us we don't have enough money to do that anyway. So, but uh, I, I think the the plan would probably be to operate with two. Um, whether that, in a perfect world, um, that may be a development one at uh, at Chinook and Coho or Chinook and Cascadura, and then an exploration one combination of either the lands on the west side or drilling some of the deep. But that'll that'll depend a lot on the Royston results and uh, the Kraken results. And I don't then, think we'll ever get to three, to be honest with you. I think in a perfect world, uh, two rigs running on the island is is about as um, much as we can manage. And the final question then, um, can you comment on the recent promotions in Touchstone and how this affects operations? Yeah, the, the promotions, I'm, I'm sure they're talking about uh, the bunch of individuals that we, we promoted here um, starting the 1st of March. And, and really what it was is as the company's now grown and we've entered a different phase, we've had to add some technical people and increase the uh, responsibilities. For instance, we never had anybody doing facilities before, so we needed to bring in some engineering people and, and put them specifically into the facility side. Uh, you know, we've never had a $2 billion gas contract before that needed managing. So, you know, we put those people in place. And we've had some people that have been around here a long time, understand what we're doing, share the vision. And uh, it's really exciting to to see them uh, expand their career and take on some more responsibilities. So it's sort of very natural. It's been a very natural progression, and it's um, you know we've been able to keep the culture in place. But it's it's great to see. Well, Paul, thank you very much indeed for presenting this evening and uh, giving us that update. I really appreciate that.